So this morning as we come together in church, if I share with you how much God loves you, how much He loves you and how much He forgives you no matter what you do, no matter what you've done or how often you do it or how bad the sin is, that God completely forgives you without fault or condemnation and He remembers your sins no more as far as the East is from the West. Most people here would welcome that kind of a message. But that's not where we're headed this morning. Instead, I want to share a message that all of us need to hear, every single one of us, and we need to be reminded of it over and over and over again throughout our lives. Because every one of us has been hurt by somebody else. And as long as we are on this planet and around people, we will be hurt and offended again. And we also will hurt or offend somebody else. Jesus taught a lot on the importance of forgiving people. And we should forgive others because He has forgiven us. One reason why we find it hard to forgive people is because we just forget. We tend to forget how much God has forgiven us for. I, I just have to think about my own life and just recognize the debt that I owed. They could not be paid, and that God forgave me, and that allows me and enables me to forgive when I remember how much God has forgiven me. And so this morning, maybe we just need to think about that a little bit more. Anytime we are having trouble forgiving somebody, maybe we just need a reminder of all the stuff and all the yuck that God has forgiven us for in our lives. We don't have to look past the person in the mirror you know it's easy to come to church and look on the outside like we're all so wonderful and doing so good and we have it all together but on the inside this morning there is a possibility that some of you here this morning may be upset you may be mad or stewing some of you may have had the unfortunate situation of riding with somebody to church in the car that you weren't getting along with this morning and then somehow when you walked through the doors, miraculously, you were able to put on a nice face like everything is great, and that will continue throughout the service until you walk back out the doors and get back in the car with the person that you were fighting with on the way to church. Maybe that didn't happen to you this morning, but I'm sure it's happened to you at some point in time on the way. I want you to know that that is not for the mature believer if you know what I'm saying, that kind of behavior, even as you come into this place, because as mature believers, we are not to take offense just because someone purposefully or even accidentally offended us. Did you know that you do not have to take the bait? You don't have to bite. You don't have to take the offense. If we would just grow up a little bit and be a little bit more mature, we don't have to be offended so easily today as people are. And as God's dear children, we need to get better at forgiving others and not becoming offended in the first place. What a difference that would make in our lives. Decide every day that you will forgive no matter who it is that irritates you. Just start out. I am not going to be offended today. Nobody is going to be able to get me upset or pull my strings or push my buttons or get my goat or rock my boat or whatever you want to say, however you want to put it. They're not going to do it to me today. And then probably you're going to walk out and immediately, boom, somebody's going to give you an opportunity to be offended. And push your buttons and pull your strings. But make that decision even before they get the chance. Give it your best shot. I challenge you. Give your best shot. Try to irritate me. I'm not really saying that. We shouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> I don't want anybody to try to get my goat uh, or irritate me. But. It should be in our hearts a decision that's already been made because of what God's done for me. It's going to be very difficult for anybody else to offend me or cause me irritation. 
There was a couple, and this is a time of year where many of us are going to different homes and going to dinners and things uh, and celebrating the time of the year. And there was a particular couple, a husband and wife, and they went to a party. And as they got to the party, they got into the living room, and everybody's loving Kinsley this morning. That's my little granddaughter, and Ben's going to take her out. So everybody watch her as she goes, Ben, goodbye. I'm not going back and telling a story about my own kids when they were little like that. Kinsley, you never cry. Oh, where was I? Oh, yeah, I was telling a story about a couple, me and Hope. Uh, <laughs> it's not us. But this couple was at this home, and they were having a party with the rest of the people, and uh, everybody was supposed to have, be having fun, enjoy your time. But what happened was this couple got irritated with each other, the husband and wife. They brought it with them. They were already on edge when they got to the party. And so they said, you know, we need to go into another room and step into another room and have a little discussion, you know, take a little chat and, and get this worked out. So they walked into the other room. Well, it started to turn into a little bit more than a spat. It started to f turn into a full-blown argument. And the husband and the wife were going at each other for, I don't know, five or six minutes. And all of a sudden, the wife realized, <gasps> sitting right there <laughs> and the husband looked over at it and the light was on and he realized down in the living room when they left that the monitor was on and so they walk out so nice and calm and everything and everybody's just like <laughs> realizing wow you guys just had at it and had a big old fight and then come to know the end of the story, the husband and the wife were a Christian couple who do Christian marriage counseling. <laughs> and everybody knew that. And so this couple, they obviously had to offer forgiveness to each other and also had to ask for forgiveness from those that they entertained that evening with their little spat. And so now you can see why we need to be reminded of this teaching because nobody is exempt. Nobody on this planet is exempt from the teaching of this forgiveness. Because pretty much every day, unless you are alone living in the mountains like Jeremiah Johnson, somebody is possibly going to bug you in some way, shape, form, or another. It's a possibility. It goes with the territory of living around people. In a fallen world. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 15. We're going to look at several verses out of this chapter. And talk a little bit about forgiveness. So Matthew 18 verse 15 says this. Moreover if your brother sins against you. Go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he hears you. You have gained your brother. Now what would you say. Go to him alone means. Privately. Go to him privately. What would you say that that means? Go to him privately. Go to him privately. Go to him alone. It's pretty simple. But as people, we struggle with that because we would much rather everybody know. I don't want it to be private. I want everybody to know what this person did to me, what they offended me for. And we go around publicly and we make our offenses known and we spread poison and cancer among us and cause division to anybody who's willing to listen. And trust me, in our world today, you got more people willing to listen to your garbage than we need. OK. The Bible says, keep it between you and the other person. Once you start talking about it to everybody else, you've already entered into an area and realm where you should not be because now you are in Satan's territory. Go privately. It is all right to confront the situation. As a matter of fact, we need to confront these situations, but it needs to be done in a right way. And maybe nobody else knows about it. And they look at you and think, why aren't you doing anything to try to make this right? And you've already done it God's way. Nobody else needs to know. Do you know why? God knows. God knows. And for me, that's all that matters. The goal of confronting should always be reconciliation. 
That should be our desire, to reconcile. Not to make the situation worse or dig up the past or be defensive or to make the other person feel bad. If I'm going there just to make the other person feel worse or bad or just pile on him or her, that's not why I should be going. The reason to approach the other brother in person is to not let them know you are not going to put up with it and that you didn't like it, but rather that you want to show grace. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? For His grace and for His peace, and that's what you should be bringing. Verses 16 and 17. If he will not hear, because believe it or not, there are some people when you go to try to reconcile, they aren't going to want anything to do with it because they just want to make it their right and they don't care what you do or say. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen. And a tax collector. Oh, you think about what the Bible is saying. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away in the New Testament church, they dealt with things a little bit differently than we deal with things today. Because in the 21st century where we live, where we are so uh, advanced, we've been told that we are supposed to tolerate pretty much everything. And we're supposed to tolerate everything all under the banner of love. The only problem is love and tolerating don't even belong in the same sentence. Did you know that? Love and tolerating don't belong together. And you will not find that kind of behavior in the New Testament. They were anything but politically correct in the New Testament church. Verse 17, again, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. What that is saying is simply this. Don't participate in foolish behavior. You don't have to engage. You don't have to be a participant in foolish behavior. Everything that we do is with the intent to help reconcile with the person, not to embarrass them or make things worse. The whole goal is to offer forgiveness and bring about reconciliation. I have to just do my part before God. We're called to a higher standard, a higher calling, higher ground. And not everybody wants to walk there, and that's fine. But we are supposed to be different. Verse 18, Assuredly, they I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have great authority as believers in Jesus Christ, but only the authority to do here on earth what heaven would do. Do you understand what that's saying? We have tremendous authority as believers, but only the authority to do what heaven would do. So basically... If you think it's okay to be upset and be mad and pay somebody back when they mess up, then what you're saying is you think that Jesus would stay mad at them and be upset with them and pay them back as well. And then you have the authority to act that way if you believe that your Savior acts that way. If that's how he treats you, then you have the authority to treat others like that. But if you're pretty sure that Jesus, your Savior, the one who died on the cross for your sins, would show grace and mercy and forgive them and even pray blessings upon them, then you do not have the authority to stay mad at them because we are called to treat others the way that Jesus would treat them. That's the authority that we have in heaven. And that's great authority. How would Jesus treat these others as christians we have authority but only the authority to do here on earth what heaven would do and all of us here this morning when we're sitting in this place we know not only what heaven would do we know what heaven did we already know what god would do verses 18 and 19 again i say er, to you 
and that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they may ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is just continuing to build on each other in these verses. And this is the power of unity in the church. God loves unity among his family as parents. How many of you love when your children are fighting and can't get along with each other? And you love it when there's yelling and screaming and chaos in the home. Doesn't that make you feel blessed? God doesn't want his children acting like that either. He wants there to be unity and peace. And you're only going to have it as you're willing to offer forgiveness to each other. You want the miracle. You want the blessing. Live in agreement. <clears throat> and that takes humility to do. We all have to live in humility if we want to have unity, even in this body of believers, even in this family. We are a family. You have a family. And the only way that you can have unity and peace is to live humbly before your God. Verse 20 of the same chapter. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Hear me this morning. Please hear this. I know that Jesus will never leave me nor forsake me, but he is happy to get in the midst of people who are loving and in agreement. That brings him joy. The Bible tells us not to grieve the spirit of God, not to quench his spirit. And the way that we do that is when we can't get along with each other. When we're not willing to forgive, when we're not willing to reconcile, when there's no peace. <clears throat> But Jesus is happy to get in the midst of people who are loving and in agreement. Verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Peter asked the question, up to seven times? Now, I want you to know when Peter's asking this question, like any of us, <clears throat> Peter's thinking that he's being pretty generous. If this was you, and you came to Jesus with this question, he's thinking he's being pretty generous here, but he also knows who he's asking. He's asking Jesus. How many times do I need to forgive? Seven? Seven times? So in his mind, he's shooting for a high standard. In his mind, he's thinking this is pretty good. But he certainly didn't think it would be more than seven or he would have said that. It's a good place to remind you that this, the disciples of Jesus had issues just like we have issues. They were not perfect people. They had jealousy among them. They had anger. They had short tempers. They were competitive with each other. They were irritable. Just like many of us in this room, they were no different than anybody else here. And for the reasons that you get upset with the myth of finding anybody who is perfect is nonsense because all of us have strengths and weaknesses every one of us here this morning we have flowers and thorns some of us have more thorns than flowers some of you have more flowers than thorns but we're all the same in that way and the more that you are around any one person the more that they are likely to offend you in some way how many of you have noticed that? Don't raise your hand, but just mentally, in your mind, you agree. If you're around somebody, you're going to recognize, yeah, they're a pain. They irritate me. And the disciples, if you think about it, they were growing men, and they lived together all the time. I guarantee you there were some tempers that would have been flaring there. Verse 22. <clears throat> In response to Peter's question, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, Peter, but up to 70 times seven. Do you have any idea what Jesus is saying here in his response? What Jesus is saying is very simply that means however many times it takes. However much it takes, forgive. Eight times, nine times, ten times, twenty times, however much it takes. That's what Jesus is saying. Not seven times. Seventy times seven. Now, you know as well as I do, 
to forgive the same person for the same thing or for different things over and over again can be even more of a challenge than forgiving somebody for something that they just did once. They, they, you got somebody in your life, they just keep doing the same thing over and over, and what is your problem? You know? Jesus says, forgive them. As much as it takes, forgive them. Forgiveness does not mean that you are going to stay in a deep relationship with the other person. Sometimes it's just not possible. It takes two to tango. It takes two to dance. If the other person is not willing, there's no way that you can have a relationship. That's true of us in God. But it has to do with your heart's attitude towards them. Guess what? You're free in my eyes. I can look you in the eyes. I can shake your hand. And I can come with you with a right heart and a right attitude because I have peace. And you might be stewing and want to knock my head off. But guess what? I can't control how you feel. I can only do what I can do. I can only ask God to help me. And that's a decision that each and every one of us have to make. Are you willing to make that every day? God says we are supposed to forgive. I started out this service by telling us that there are people in stores that are fighting and it's supposed to be a, the happiest time of the year. People are living on edge. This is a message that we all need to hear, every single one of us, that we need to be forgiving people. Do you know if you're forgiving people, you can't ever get into a fight and keep it going? Because I forgive you. I'm not going to fight with you. It was interesting when we were growing, or raising our children, we had three boys and one girl. And that's why Kelly's the way she is today. Because she had three brothers to deal with. And the boys, they always liked to wrestle and get into these little spats and tufts, and, and they'd go at it. And that's cool because I did the same thing when I was a kid. You know, I had three brothers. There were four of us, and we about tore the house down sometimes. My mom broke more than one yardstick across my back. Break, stop it, break it up. You know. But as Kelly got older, she realized when the boys want to try to start something with her and start wrestling, if she would just go limp i'm not participating they're like man you ain't no fun and they go on to do something else go find somebody else to wrestle with because they're like you're not wrestling back you i want somebody who's going to fight with me or wrestle with me and in play they weren't trying to hurt it's just and she just realized if i don't participate it's no fun for them that's what i'm kind of saying to us is those who want to be people who live with forgiveness i'm not going to fight with you i am not going to spread poison about you garbage about you i'm not going to engage with your foolish behavior with your bitterness with your anger i'm just going to trust god with it and that's where you have to come and you can come to that place in your own heart and life because guess what god has forgiven me of an incredible debt remember i already told you that when i remember that there's nothing that i should be able to not, not forgive others for one of the things we have to remember is that hurting people hurt other people. There are people out there who are hurting, and when they're hurting, they're going to say things, they're going to do things, they're going to act certain ways. It doesn't excuse it. It doesn't excuse their behavior, but it shows a maturity level that you don't want to go down there. If you're going to put two two-year-olds together, they're going to fight. If you have a two-year-old and an adult, there should not be this conflict and fight. The adult should be able to deal with that. The mature person. Everybody has flaws. Every single one of us have flaws. I have plenty. Ask my wife. She has a list of them. Naughty and nice. And it's so easy to see the flaws in other people. Why is that? Why is it that I can look out at you and see the flaws so easy in you? And you can look at me and see the flaws so easy in me or other people that you're around. The problem is, while we see other people's shortcomings quite easily, we do not always recognize our own flaws quite so easily. Anybody guilty of that? It is so easy to see everybody else's flaws, but I don't see any flaws in me. But it's so easy to find, and you can do the same thing. It's so easy for you to see flaws in other people. But when it comes to you, it's hard to see the flaws because we don't want to think about that. And even if we do, 
see our own flaws. Even if that happens, or even if it's pointed out, very often we are quick to make excuses for ourselves, or we become defensive. Have you ever seen that? <clears throat> when somebody points out a flaw or something that you're doing wrong, oh, that makes me mad. Makes me defensive. I'm going to rise up and become defensive. For us, there is always an excuse. But for others, there is no reason for them to behave that way. Forgiveness is something that is so necessary in our world because we all stand in need of it, every single one of us. And that's why Jesus talked so much about it. And I want you to know that forgiveness is not excusing bad behavior. It's not sweeping something under the rug. It forgives the offense. Jesus says, stop counting how many times you have forgiven somebody and just live at peace with them. You see, our anger and our refusal to forgive cost us more than we could possibly ever imagine. If you are an unforgiving person, you have no idea what damage you are doing to yourself, the harm that you are causing to yourself. Unforgiveness imprisons the person who is not willing to forgive. It is a poison that eats us away from the inside out, and it hinders our relationship with God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. How many of you believe that verse this morning? I can only pray that more Christians would live like they believed that verse. Do you know how many angry, unforgiving Christians approach the throne of grace and they're asking God for things all the time? Mad at somebody else? Unforgiving? Do you think that God is pleased with that? If you stay angry, it gives the devil a foothold in your life. It gives the devil a place in your life. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, be angry, fine, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. You see, God doesn't tell us not to be angry. I think we we have a time, so many times, where we mess the scriptures up, we twist scriptures. He doesn't tell us not to get angry. He tells us we're going to get angry, but we need to control it. Do you know the difference? Don't let your anger get over into an area of sin. Don't you hate it when you think about this verse right here, when you get mad at somebody right before bedtime? Because it doesn't give you a lot of time to stew over it. Because most people would rather be upset with others and stew about it for a while. And if it's close to nighttime, what you do when you're not willing to forgive and reconcile and make it right before you go to bed You're angry and the sun goes down and you go to bed and it's your husband or your wife and you go to bed and you're like, fine, I'll show her. I'm going to sleep on the end of this mattress. I'll teach her a lesson. And you're on the end of that mattress with your back towards her and you got about as much mattress as this because you want her to know you're ticked. And you lay there for a couple hours and you think, man, this is miserable and she's snoring over there. It's not even right. I'm mad trying to teach her a lesson. Not only that, she's got all the covers, and I'm over here freezing on the end of the mattress, and I still ain't going to talk to her. How many times does that happen in people's lives? And God says, man, woman, (laughs) make it right. Offer forgiveness. You're just being foolish. Proverbs, a fool suffers a lot more than a wise man. When you go to bed mad with your partner, that's not a good thing to do. You're just being foolish because you're not going to sleep well. Staying angry gives Satan an advantage over us that he does not need. Do you know that Satan does not need an excuse to have an advantage over us? It is the bait of Satan to steal the presence of God from you, to hinder your anointing and your power and your authority to get you into disagreement so that your prayers are feeble. There's absolutely no upside to unforgiveness. There is nothing at all positive to being unforgiving. 
And so I close with this in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says, if it is possible, if it's possible, as much as it depends with you, live peaceably with all men. That's all God's saying. As much as it depends on you, live at peace. Your husband wants to fight. You don't have to engage. Your wife wants to be a drip on the roof. Chinese torture. You don't have to participate. As much as it depends on you, you have the authority, you have the power to live at peace in any and every situation and to be forgiving. Offer forgiveness. Satan, you have no power over me anymore. I've already forgiven that. That used to hold a lot of weight in my life. It has nothing in my life anymore. It's done. It's dealt with. And you can say, but they, well, they, don't make it about them. It's about Jesus, and it's about your relationship with him. And so as we come to this table this morning, the only reason, the only, the only reason that we are able to come to this table this morning is because God himself, through his son, Jesus Christ, forgave us. He forgave us. And as we partake of these elements, the bread and the cup this morning, what that should remind us of, if there is anybody that I have anything in my heart that is hindering my relationship with Jesus and the authority that I have there, I need to make that right. I can tell you this. I have no enemies. Oh, trust me. I have people that don't like me. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I have no enemies. I have people that don't like me, but it doesn't come from me. That's not the way I feel. And that's the way it should be with each and every one of us. You do not have to take the bait of Satan and be offended. You don't have to listen to the garbage and the poison and the cancer and be caught up in foolish behavior because Jesus laid down his life. We can forgive one another. I can forgive my wife, Hope. And she, praise God, forgives me. I thanked her as I was preparing this message. Thank you, Hope, for your forgiveness for the last 34 years. And she's forgiven me more than seven times. I don't think it's quite 70 times seven. It might be close. I don't even know what that number is. 400. Oh, well, we might have passed that one. <laughs> but I'm thankful that she's forgiven me. And we're still husband and wife because of forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And so as we partake of this supper this morning, aren't you thankful for God's forgiveness? What a peace, what a peace, what a joy that brings to our hearts and our minds. And because he has forgiven me, guess what? I can forgive others. And as we partake, let us remind ourselves of that this morning. This is a great reminder, especially at this time of the year, because believe it or not, even though it's the happiest time of the year, people are Mean, mean, mean to each other all the time. And they fight with each other and they don't like each other and they kick them out the door. And they're always looking for more. We don't have to do that. Let this be a wonderful time like the rest of the year. You be a blessing to somebody that you come across. The elders are already here. We're gathered.